The Castanis family resided in West Jordan, Utah in 1991. The family consisted of Father Sam, 43, Mother Margaret, 39, and their three kids, Melissa, 11, Clinton, 9, and Christine, 6. Margaret stayed at home with the kids while Sam worked for the Salt Lake County Public Works. Neighbors described them as a typical urban family. Margaret, being the more outgoing of the two, was described as the welcome wagon of the neighborhood. She wrote poetry and wanted to publish a children's book someday. Sam has been described as neat and organized and highly skilled at his job as a heavy equipment operator. On November 17th, Sam walked into the house after finishing up some projects in his garage. He came upon a grisly scene, finding his son Clinton lying in a pool of blood on the bathroom floor. My son Clint Costana is bleeding really severe. He's uh, chopped his fingers off. I thought it was bleeding from, bleeding from his mouth, but his fingers uh, can't get anything at all. His fingers have been chopped off? It looks like, yeah. Once the police arrived, they found Clint deceased with several stab wounds to his chest. They followed a trail of blood leading to the basement where they found Melissa and Christine both deceased. They had also been stabbed several times and Christine's throat had been cut. Lying next to the girls was their mother, Margaret. She had several stab wounds to her chest. There was also what looked like defensive wounds on her hands. Police immediately suspected Sam as the killer. He had blood on his jeans and there was no sign of forced entry into the home. He denied having anything to do with the killing of his family. I did not kill my family. I did not use a hammer on him. I did not use a knife. I'm telling the truth. That's the whole truth. Despite his denial, he was arrested and taken to jail. After spending four days in jail awaiting his charges, he was turned loose. Investigators didn't have enough evidence to charge him with anything. Reporters were waiting outside the jail for him as he left. He was penniless, so he asked them for change to call his sister to pick him up. They also bought him a cup of coffee at the gas station where he made the call. As he was waiting for his sister to arrive, he told the reporters, I don't like being in a place like that jail, and I don't want to be in there again. The joint funeral was held at the church the Castanis family attended, where Sam was surrounded by family. Margaret's family supported him and didn't believe he was capable of killing his family. Margaret was a self-taught pianist and guitarist. A song that she had written was played for the congregation. The kids were described as well-behaved. Melissa played the accordion and Clinton wanted to operate heavy equipment like his dad. Christine was a curious little girl with bouncy curly hair. After the death of his family, Sam moved in with his sister, and shortly after the funeral, he returned to work. Margaret's family continued their support for him, never doubting his story. Investigators considered Sam their number one suspect, but the case was difficult because he had assisted the rescue crew with his family. In addition to that, the four victims shared the same blood type. On June 16, 1992, Sam was arrested and charged with four counts of aggravated murder after seven months of police piecing together the evidence. Facing a possible death penalty if convicted, Sam hired a well-known defense attorney by the name of Ron Yangich. The prosecuting attorney, Kent Morgan, stated that there was no evidence that any of the wounds suffered by the victims were self-inflicted. Along with his denials, Sam had told investigators that Margaret had killed the children then inflicted the stab wounds to herself. 
The prosecutor then claimed that the wounds on Margaret's hands were evidence that she was trying to ward off attacks. It was also stated that Margaret's body and the weapons had been moved in such a way to make it look like she committed the killings. Furthermore, the weapons had been wiped clean according to the prosecutor. Officers testified that Sam wasn't acting like a grieving father and one of them overheard him approach Margaret's body and say, Margaret, you've killed yourself. Investigators also found what they believed to be a bloody handprint belonging to one of the girls on Sam's jacket. There was also blood splatter on Mr. Costanis's pants and shoes indicating he was in immediate proximity to a blunt instrument striking blood on at least three separate occasions stated blood splatter expert Ron Englert. It was also claimed that bloody footprints leading down the stairs were consistent with Sam forcing Margaret down the stairs, causing her to step in the blood with her stocking feet. In addition, blood was found on Sam's body, inconsistent with someone providing assistance to victims. Contrary to his statement to the police, Sam Castanis was inside the residence at the time of the killings and had possession of the murder weapon prior to the arrival of authorities, Englert concluded. The autopsies revealed that each of the victims died from multiple stab wounds and blunt force trauma from a hammer. Melissa and Christine were both stabbed several times, mostly on their left side, and both sustained multiple blows to their head with a hammer. Clint suffered several stab wounds and blows to the head as well. Margaret suffered nine stab wounds to the chest, four of which were superficial. One of the defense witnesses would later agree with the prosecution that this was indicative of hesitation wounds, marks where someone contemplating suicide first tests the waters. The defense presented to the court evidence of Margaret's state of mind around the time of the killings. She was being treated for chronic fatigue syndrome, severe depression, and revealed to friends that she wanted to die. To the same friends, she also said that Sam was a good husband and deserved better. She had become withdrawn and paranoid in the recent months with one doctor speculating on schizophrenia as a possible diagnosis. Margaret worried about the effect her death would have on her children, yet she didn't want to leave them with Sam to raise alone. The defense accused the prosecution of counting on blood splatter testimony too heavily and called into doubt that the weapons had been wiped clean. Yangich also cross-examined the officers that interrogated Sam. He questioned them as to why they didn't pursue the theory that Margaret killed the children and then herself. He also asked why the interrogation seemed to be cut short and the officer's response was that either the tape ran out or there was nothing more of importance that was being said. Yangich answered with, the balance of what was said between you and Mr. Castanis maybe was not important to you, but could have been in the resolution of this case. The prosecution witness, Ron Englert, who testified as to the blood splatter, was unaware of Margaret's mental condition. Therefore, he pieced together the scenario that Sam did it because he was the only suspect. The Castanis marriage was described and Margaret told a friend that she still got butterflies when she saw her husband, even after 15 years of marriage. It was also stated that Sam was a caring and loving husband. Sam had been advised by Margaret's doctor to admit her to a psychiatric hospital, but at the last minute, Margaret refused. Their insurance was not going to cover the stay, and Margaret didn't want to use the family funds to pay for it. Dr. Kimberly Walsh testified that she had seen Margaret just four months prior to the deaths. She had complained of low self-esteem, eating disorders, and depression. 
the doctor implored her to go to a psychiatric hospital. Dr. Walsh also mentioned a friend of Margaret's that she had become unusually close to. This woman apparently had multiple personality disorder and Margaret was becoming frightened of her. She claimed that this friend was bugging her home and tapping her phones. She also stated that she thought there was a device implanted in her head so the neighbor could send her messages in Morse code. Despite these issues, Margaret stopped seeing the doctor because of the financial burden on her family. The defense called Dr. John Burton, an Atlanta area chief medical examiner hired by the defense to the stand. He demonstrated how perpetrators wielding a knife often receive the types of wounds Margaret had on her hands when the knife becomes slippery with blood and it slides down. He also stated that it is possible for people to stab themselves more than once, adding that if they are determined to kill themselves, they'll find a way. Dr. Burton concluded that Mrs. Castanis had lost control and killed herself and the children. He said that besides her bizarre behavior in the months before, Margaret had been prescribed prednisone, which Burton said was notorious for causing psychosis in some people. Margaret's mother, Frances Jenkins, took the stand and said she spoke with her daughter the night before she and her three children were killed. I never heard a voice so flat, she said. There's nothing more to say, and that's it. That's the only thing she said. She also added that her daughter once told her, you may have to raise these children. And I said, Margaret, they need their mother. Margaret replied, I can't leave the kids with you and I can't leave the kids with Sam alone and I can't go on. Sam was called to the stand. He recounted how the couple had met and said it was a good relationship. I loved her and she loved me, he said. When asked if they ever fought, Sam answered never. Mr. Castana said he first noticed a change in his wife about the middle of 1990 after the death of a nephew who was close to Margaret. She started staying up late at night. She just had to keep going. She couldn't sit down, he said. One night, she painted the grout in our bathroom. Defense attorney Ron Yangich closed by saying, Let their daughter and their grandchildren rest. Let them rest in peace. Once in this case, come back and tell the state of Utah, not with hatred or anger, that they're wrong. Give them eight words, not guilty, four times. The jury deliberated for eight hours and came back with a not guilty verdict on all counts. Sam said after the verdict was read, I've waited a year and a half for this. Margaret's father, Oren Jenkins, also said, That jury gave us our son back. He's all we've got left of his and Margaret's family. This is the beginning of Sam Castanis's new life said defense attorney Ron Yangich. It'll be a hard life, but he's the kind of man who can live that kind of life and go on. Jurors would later say that when they first started their deliberations, the majority of the jury thought he was innocent. So it wasn't a unanimous verdict. One thing they all agreed on was how sloppy the police work had been. Police and prosecutors only looked for the things that supported their case. We felt it was a very slipshod job that there were things blatantly wrong with what they did. According to Ron Yangich, defending his innocence bankrupted Sam Castanis. He returned to work two weeks after the trial and has since remarried. He is still living in Utah. Thank you everybody for watching today and until next time, take care.